Good luck. Welcome everybody. We're going to give it a few moments to have everybody find their way into this webinar. Welcome. Again, just uh, wanted to welcome everybody who's logging in and to give you a heads up, we're gonna, we're gonna wait a few more moments for all of the participants to join in. This is a great time to grab some water, create as comfortable of a space for yourself as you can. Again, just a quick welcome to everybody as folks are logging in. Uh, we will wait another moment or two for the webinar to begin. The audio and video has been disabled for all participants in order to uh, facilitate this webinar. So we will use the Q&A and the chat windows to stay connected. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and officially begin the webinar. It is about 1.05. We will likely have more participants joining us, but I want to be respectful of your time. And we have a lot of information to cover. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to the introduction to trauma-informed care, uh, particularly in long-term care. 
just as an orientation, we do have the audio and video disabled for all the participants. And for this reason, we won't use the raise hand feature. Uh, all questions and responses and can be uh, directed to the Q&A and the chat windows. We are going to uh, be recording this um, webinar and that recording will be for uh, internal uh, purposes. So we will not make the recording public and the recording will not be available to participants themselves. Um, so we're asking uh, you to remain in participation mode as is available to you. So Oregon Care Partners is a free high quality education resource. We help family and professional caregivers build the knowledge and skills needed to improve the quality of life for older adults and people living with dementia in Oregon. The free training is made possible through funding from the state of Oregon to provide consistent standardized evidence-based training for caregivers in all areas of the state. You can find out more in terms of classes and webinars at OregonCarePartners.com. Here is a brief overview of uh, COVID-19 care practices. Uh, so we ask you to just briefly remind yourself and review these. Uh, this course is intended to provide education and awareness on the topic of trauma-informed care. Um, I will not be providing any legal or medical advice on how to manage particular situations that you encounter. Um, so if you have any such questions or concerns regarding your role, we ask you to please consult your supervisor and your facility's policies and procedures. Again, especially at this time, we ask you to learn and follow the guidelines and specific policies and procedures for care practices and reporting of COVID-19 as outlined by the Oregon Health Authority, Oregon Department of Human Services, and setting where you provide care. In terms of some tips as to how the webinar uh, will proceed, again, everyone is muted and is in listen mode, uh, but we will still invite your participation. And we'll do this in a number of ways, including inviting you to chat into the chat box these chats are visible to either all panelists or all participants or attendees, and you can select that as is meaningful to you. So if you have any questions of me, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A or the chat box, and we will make sure we have ample time to attend to uh, a number of questions. If there are any other questions that I do not get to, or you feel like you haven't uh, gotten ample response to, then I would encourage you to please uh, contact me and my contact information will be available to you at the end of this presentation. Let's talk a little bit about the course layout. We will be together for three hours. Uh, this webinar offers three continuing education units and just like with any other opportunities to receive continuing education units, you are asked to please attend the full three hours uh, and the way that you're going to demonstrate that you've been here the full three hours is actually by completing the post test that you will receive at the end of the webinar. So please be sure to um, connect with the post test, which will be at the end of the webinar. And I'll say a little more about that uh, toward the end of the webinar. Uh, there will be a pre test or a sort of self evaluation that we're going to do in a few minutes. Uh, presentation slides and handouts will be made available to you through the Oregon Care Partners account. If for some reason the test doesn't pop up for you at the end of this webinar, 
you are welcome to contact our support team at info at oregoncarepartners.com. And again, I'll make sure that this information is available to you in the final slide of this webinar. In terms of being together for three hours, I want to encourage you to please take good care of yourselves. We will have a formal break about halfway through and it'll be about 10 minutes long. So that would be a great time to shift your body as feels comfortable and safe for you, uh, to make sure you have ample water and other supports. Uh, you are welcome to um, make this as effective of a learning experience for you as possible. We do acknowledge the fatigue that sometimes comes along with looking at a screen. So again, please take care of yourself as you know best how. So before I introduce myself, I wanna give you a agenda for the course. Here are some things that we will cover. Uh, again, this is Introduction to Trauma-Informed Care, uh, specifically in long-term care facilities and long-term care generally. So what we'll talk about is what is trauma-informed care? And more importantly, why is it important? Why is it important in long-term care? We'll review the quote-unquote science of trauma-informed care, and then we'll delve into the application of what does this mean for us intrapersonally? What does it mean for us interpersonally? And then how can we operationalize these trauma-informed practices? How can we ensure that our programs and organizations are implementing trauma-informed care in a way that is realizing the widespread impact of trauma and pathways to recovery, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma and toxic stress, not just in the people that we serve, but also in our colleagues and our, um, the families of. And then actually responding through our policies and procedures, through our practices, responding even in the environments that we set up. And finally, operationalizing through resisting re-traumatization. So the intent here is to set a context, to sort of set up a common language, if you will, or common knowledge, so that we each, in whatever role we play in our day-to-day -day lives, in our professional lives, in our daily lives, we identify a role for ourselves within trauma-informed care. Everyone has a role to play in trauma-informed care. And so your job today is really to just filter what I share with you through your specific context, your specific lived experience, professional experience, daily experience. You're really the expert and I want to honor that. And we're looking to integrate all that you know and the best practices that have been informing your daily experience with what is now known as trauma-informed care. We will have opportunities to participate via polls and this icon that you see in the bottom uh, with the hands is going to alert you to a poll coming up and that'll be a great opportunity to give some of your own thoughts and feedback as well as I will invite you to uh, keep the chat going as it seems to be um, alive already. So just a little bit about me. My name is Anna Hristic. Again, I will share my contact information at the end of the, of the presentation. I am the Director of Education and Workforce Strategy at Trauma-Informed Oregon. Uh, I'm delighted to have partnered with Oregon Care Partners to uh, develop and uh, share this training with you. And this training had a lot of uh, incredible eyes and ears uh, incorporating their feedback into the content. And so the ex experience of both the lived experience and quote unquote professional experience has been integrated into this. So I speak with a lot of gratitude and on behalf of uh, the many people who have contributed to the content.
here's what I'm uh, seeking to uh, provide for you today. Here are our objectives and outcomes, and our hope is that uh, by the end of the three hours, uh, you will have uh, some competency in identifying ways of understanding possible reasons behind an individual's behavior, thinking, or way of relating by using knowledge of the quote-unquote near science of trauma. And we'll talk a little bit more about what near stands for and how that science informs our understanding of possible reasons behind an individual's behavior. We also hope that you'll be able to explain how the functions of the brain may be impacted by stress and trauma. We hope that you'll be able to operationalize each of the six principles of trauma-informed care in your day-to-day -day lives and your day-to-day -day work. And finally, that you'll be able to commit to at least one strategy aimed toward inclusivity through the lens of trauma-informed care. So again, we invite you to consider your role today through the lens of how does this content relate to the people that you serve on a day-to-day -day basis? How does it relate to your role? And how can you use this information when working with each other? One thing that you'll quickly learn about trauma-informed care, it is not only about the people that we serve, the consumers, but it's also actually about each other. It's about our colleagues, it's about our family members, it's about our partners and community members. Just as with any gathering, we want to establish some agreements and expectations. And so we really invite everybody's participation in your own way. That might mean putting comments in the chat box and presenting Q and A's as they are available to you. It may mean taking notes as is available to you. We really invite you to approach the content and each other with a respectful and respected um, presence. We're not gonna shy away from tough subjects, but we certainly will do our very best to collaborate with you on facilitating an emotionally and physically safe environment. We certainly do not expect uh, answers to all the questions that arise, but do invite a sense of collaboration in considering the questions. We will certainly be mindful of confidentiality. And last but not least, we encourage you to consider the people, consumers, customers, clients, residents, service users that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd like to take this moment to invite you to consider whose land you are on. So if you would, in the chat box, as many of you have already done in introducing where you are located in Oregon or beyond, we also would invite you to actually honor the original people and land and tribal territory that you are on. This is a way to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land th throughout generations. So I am here in Northeast Portland, and so I'd like to recognize the Multnomah, Clackamas, Colwewala, and Cascade bands of the Shinookan people, and the Tualatin band of Kalapuya. These indigenous peoples signed the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855 and were later forcibly removed from their homelands to the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation. Their descendants live today as members of the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde. Many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River have connected to this place as well, and their descendants also live on. And so I acknowledge the ancestors and survivors of this place and recognize they were here because of their sacrifice that was forced upon them. I honor their legacy, their lives, 
They're descendants who carry on tribal traditions for present and future generations. And thank you for continuing to enter into the chat box as a way to honor both the people and the sovereign territories. So who are we talking about today? Who is in this virtual room, if you will? We have over 100 people registered for the conference for the webinar. There are about 80 of you currently logged in. Uh, this includes foster care providers, personal support workers, direct support professionals, CNA, CNAs, many others. And in terms of who, for the duration of this webinar, we will refer to as quote unquote consumers. We are referring to older adults with or without dementia and assisted living, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in residential services, older adults, people with disabilities who receive services, adults with physical disabilities in residential services, and so on. And so again, for the purposes of this webinar and in the spirit of Oregon Care Partners uh, way of uh, communicating, we're going to refer to uh, our participants, service users, clients as quote unquote consumers. So this is the moment where you're going to have an opportunity to uh, answer some questions in a poll that I will make public in a moment. I want to acknowledge that this poll will be uh, anonymous, so your particular answers will not be shared. But it'll just give us a, a sense of where you find yourself in a spectrum of a series of questions. There are no uh, right or wrong ways to answer this, especially because it is an expression of your own understanding currently of uh, trauma-informed care where you are. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and I'm going to uh, read the questions out loud. Question number one is that many of the consumers and staff that I work with have experienced trauma. So the answers are anywhere from not sure to strongly agree. And you're invited to vote by clicking on an answer and we'll move on to the next one. Again, we'll be able to uh, make public the summary of these answers. So your individual answers will not be made public. It'll just be a summary of. I'll go ahead and move on to question two. When consumers or staff have experienced trauma, current or in the past, this can influence their current behavior. I see we have about 25 responses, many more still coming in. Question number three says, seeking and receiving services can be re-traumatizing for trauma survivors. Seeking and receiving services can be re-traumatizing for trauma survivors. And again, the answers can be anywhere from not sure to strongly disagree to strongly agree. We have two more questions. Question four is, our programs and services do not create trauma for our consumers. Our programs and services do not create trauma for our consumers.
It's wonderful to see your participation. I see at least half of you are able to access the poll and give your feedback. And question number five, working with trauma survivors can result in work-related stress, such as vicarious trauma. Again, working with trauma survivors can result in work-related stress, such as vicarious trauma. Wonderful, we have about 70% of you who've completed the survey. I'll give it another moment. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And I'll share the results. Again, this is just the way to orient to our community's current attitudes and knowledge. And it seems like for the first question of many consumers and staff I work with have experienced trauma, about 60% of you strongly agree. For question number two, when consumers or staff have experienced trauma, current or in the past, this can influence their current behavior. Over 86% of you strongly agree. Seeking and receiving services can be re-traumatizing for trauma survivors. Over 60% of you strongly agree. Our programs and services do not create trauma for our consumers. Over 20% of, 20 of you moderately disagree. 16% of you strongly disagree. Others mildly agree and so on. So this will be a rich question to look into as we unpack the content. The last question is, working with trauma survivors can result in work-related stress, such as vicarious trauma, and over 50% of you strongly agree. Thank you so much for participating in this. We'll have some more opportunities to uh, share in knowledge with each other. So this just gave you a little bit of an overview of some of the knowledge and um, content that we will cover today. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. So before we can even begin to identify what trauma-informed care is, we are first being asked to actually define what we mean by trauma. So trauma-informed care requires us to broaden our lens on what we mean by quote-unquote trauma. Trauma is really anything that overwhelms one's ability to cope. It can be a single event, but more often, it's actually multiple events over time. So this includes complex and prolonged trauma. It is imperative that in your understanding of trauma-informed care, and henceforth in your understanding of trauma, you are able to also take collective, historical, and generational trauma into account. That is, trauma doesn't only happen to an individual. It actually more often than not happens to a collection, a collective of people, whether that's a family system, a neighborhood, a community, a nation of people, a age range of people, and the trauma isn't necessarily over. More often than not, it actually continues even today. The historical impacts of trauma that has occurred in the past live on in our bodies, in our communities for multiple generations. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration says that individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that's experienced by an, individually, by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that it has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental health, physical health, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So often in the trauma-informed care world, we refer to what SAMHSA shared as the three E's, 
the event, the experience, and the effect. And the part that I want to underscore here is that trauma is not trauma is not trauma. That is to say that uh, what one person experiences as toxic or traumatic for them may not be shared by another person. So this is not to minimize anyone else's trauma, but the current reality is based on one's identity actually often mediates the experience of trauma and differentially impacts our effects of that potentially traumatic event. So oftentimes there are questions around, yeah, but you know, I've experienced divorce, let's say, and I, it actually wasn't traumatic for me. If anything, I found it liberating. Why are you having such a difficult time with it? And I guess that's one way to really get to the heart of the matter, which is that my trauma may not be yours. And that to be trauma informed is to take the truth of the person with the lived experience as the truth. To really honor that people will define what is toxic to them and that our job in a trauma informed system is to actually believe them. So let me go ahead and share another poll with you and ask you, to your best knowledge, what examples of trauma and toxic stress have consumers experienced that you have worked with? And here you can actually pick multiple answers at once. Again, to your best knowledge, what examples of trauma have consumers experienced that you've worked with? And some of the answers include war, abuse, natural or human caused disasters, secondary losses, including life roles such as occupation, the experience of even entering care, transferring from one residence to another, often against one's own will, experiencing abuse in care or serious illness, and really a history of witnessing all of the above. Again, we have about 55% of you already completing the survey. I'm so appreciative of your participation. We'll give it another minute. Another 30 seconds. Wonderful. We have over 90% of you submitting answers. I really appreciate this. It's wonderful to share space with you and to hear about your understanding and knowledge. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. I imagine there are many other forms of toxic stress and trauma that you all could name. I think again, for the purposes of moving us along with the content, we just presented a few. And maybe to some of you, some of these uh, feel new and a novel lens through which to understand uh, your consumer's background. Some of you maybe have had explicit conversations about these particular forms of trauma and toxic stress with your consumers. And some of you are in a sense assuming that it is present. What trauma-informed care is looking to do is take a universal precaution. We are not suggesting that everybody, given their defined roles and expectations within their um, role with the consumer, we're not suggesting that everybody sit down with uh, fellow service users and talk about, hey, what experience of trauma have you had? That type of sharing may be um, traumatic to both individuals. And so in most cases, we're not actually suggesting that that is best practice. Instead, this notion of universal precaution, meaning assuming that trauma, toxic stress, and adversary, adversity are likely in the room when we are encountering each other.
because if we just assume that it's likely in the room, we will do less harm. If it's not in the room, we may just be experienced as really lovely and predictable and kind. And if it is in the room, we will be experienced as safe and healing and not re-traumatizing. So as you can see in the shared results, um, there are multiple forms of adversity that our consumers have experienced. And again, these forms that I share with you here are forms of uh, toxic stress and trauma that have been shared with us as we prepared this content for you. Uh, so experiences of entering care, experiences of transferring from one residence to another, and so on, are uh, experienced on a daily basis by the people that we serve. So as we define trauma, we can move into what we mean by trauma-informed care. Now I want to underscore for you that even though there's the word care in the title trauma-informed care, trauma-informed care is actually not a therapeutic service. It is not intended to be a healing modality. That's actually a trauma-specific service. Uh, trauma-specific service is anything from um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy or particular somatic or body healing work, including acupuncture or um, prayer or massage or dance. Um, it could be a group therapeutic environment uh, following a particular curriculum like seeking safety. Those are all therapeutic trauma-specific services. Trauma-informed care, on the other hand, is more what you see on the screen in front of you. It is what a program, organization, or system is seeking to be. And so for a program, organization, or system to be trauma-informed, they have to, one, realize the widespread impact of trauma, toxic stress, and adversity, as well as potential paths to recovery. So to realize how trauma can affect families, groups, organizations, communities, as well as individuals. People's experience and behavior are understood in the context of coping strategies designed to survive adversity and overwhelming circumstances. Whether these occurred in the past or whether they're related to the emotional distress that results currently we must also realize paths to recovery, resilience, and wellness. So again, that's the first R, to realize. The second R is to recognize. Recognize what? Recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, toxic stress and adversity, both in consumers, their families, but also in staff and others involved in the system, the system that you work with, the system of long-term care, for example. So again, a program organization or system is trauma-informed if it realizes, recognizes, and then third, actually responds. Responds by fully integrating the knowledge of what we know about trauma and toxic stress into how we set up our physical spaces, into how we inform our practices, our procedures, and our policies. So we want, what we want to do is actually make sure we use the information that, for example, you're going to be learning about today to inform our practice, inform the way we greet each other, inform the way we set up our entryway, inform the way that we host a meeting with a family, inform the way that we set up certain policies around um, ending of services, for example. And last but not least, and in many cases, really most importantly, the fourth R of trauma-informed care is to resist re-traumatization. What we mean by resisting re-traumatization of consumers as well as staff is that organizations often inadvertently create stressful or toxic environments that interfere with the recovery of consumers the well-being of staff, and ultimately the fulfillment of the organization's mission. So resisting re-traumatization is really at the forefront of trauma-informed care.
going back to our pre-assessment question around our services and our care potentially being re-traumatizing, it's oftentimes the voice of the people that simply seeking care and engaging in our services could actually be re-traumatizing for the people that we are actually looking to be of service to most. Many of you are probably familiar with person-centered care. And in a sense, person-centered care can be mapped onto trauma-informed care really nicely. Person-centered care really requires us to know the person uh, in a full way and to actually do person-centered care is to do trauma-informed care. Let's talk a little bit about why trauma-informed care is important, and I'd like to invite your voice here as well. Generally speaking, we would say that trauma-informed care is important because trauma and toxic stress are pervasive and really often underreported. What we think we know about the numbers is actually probably much worse than the numbers show at this point. That trauma is often the result of others' experience of one's identity. That much of lived experience and really the data shows that there continues to be a disproportionality of experience for certain identities, including people with certain skin color. Trauma's impact is broad, deep, and life-shaping that it's not that it, it begins and ends at a certain point and then its impact is over when the wound, let's say, heals. The impact of adversity and toxic stress really lives on and shapes one's understanding of oneself in the world profoundly. That really trauma affects how people engage in services. And this last line feels important to me for us to talk a little bit more about that even though trauma can happen to anyone, the notion of healing is really more challenging if one is denied access to resources and supports based on how others experience their identity. Really, the service system has often been activating or re-traumatizing for a lot of people. And so if, I, if my primary language is not English, my ability to access healing services uh, after a traumatic event, for example, in a community where those services are simply not available, let alone are not culturally responsive, the experience and the effect, remember those three E's, my experience and effect of that particular event will actually be exacerbated. And that's not because English is not my first language, it's because the environment I'm finding myself in the environment of our community is not actually made for all equally. That is why trauma-informed care is important. So as a provider, assuming that things may be perceived differently by service users is actually probably best practice. Assuming that things may be perceived differently by consumers, that the brain and the body react the same to actual and perceived threat that the brain really doesn't know much different between what I perceive to be true and what's actually true. If I perceive a threatening situation, my body will react as though it is threatening. That why is trauma-informed care important? It's important because sometimes we, as the service providers, if you will, we might actually be the ones being perceived as a threat because much harm has been done by people in service provider uh, roles, if you will. So let me go ahead and share another poll with you. And ask you, to your best knowledge, which of these experiences are true for the consumers you work with? Why is it that trauma-informed care is important in long-term care? Is it that the consumers you work with have experienced ageism and ableism? And again, you can pick multiple answers. Is trauma-informed care important in long-term care because reactivation in long-term care and healthcare settings can occur? Meaning that sometimes long-term care itself may be triggering or activating? 
Is it because is, is trauma informed care important in long term care because activation can happen related to end of life? Or because consumers coping skills are compromised because they've been moved into an environment where those coping skills may no longer be available to them? Is trauma informed care important in long term care because of a um, misdiagnosis or over or under medicating that may happen in long term care? Being cut off from social network or a sense of purpose? The turnover of staff in long term care? lack of inclusion and belonging, particularly around certain spiritual or uh, cultural practices. So we'll give it another 30 seconds. Over 70 of you, 70% 70 of you have contributed. And again, here we're trying to answer why is trauma-informed care important in long-term care? What are some of the experiences that you know to be true for the consumers you work with. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll with over 80% of you having contributed. And here are some of the results from our community today. Again, these uh, prompts uh, these categories of lived experience have been shared with us by those who've contributed to the development of this content. So some of you, it seems like, have come into contact with consumers who've had the experience of uh, compromised coping skills. Um, over half of you have come into contact with consumers who've experienced ageism and ableism, who feel activated uh, as a result of uh, end of life care, a misdiagnosis or over or under medicating, being cut off from social networks and sense of purpose. So I'll let you review these answers all through the guise of, all through the lens of this. This is why trauma-informed care is important in long-term care. Because this is the lived experience of so many of the people that we serve on a daily basis. And so for yourself, just take a moment to see what else is not on this list that you would name as why trauma-informed care is important in long-term care. If you feel called to, you're welcome to share it in the chat box. But the why is really important. As we continue to unpack this content and talk about the science of trauma and then ultimately move on to application, really we invite you to stay grounded in the why. It's not because it's the new thing that trauma-informed care is important. It's not because it's just the kind thing to do, the nice thing to do. It's not only because it'll actually make your jobs easier, but it's because of all of this. It's because of all of this lived experience of the people that we serve on a daily basis. So again, if you don't see the why in this chat box or in this poll, Feel free to put it in the chat box so that we can uh, hear from you as well. Why is trauma-informed care important in long-term care? So we're going to take the next few minutes to talk about the near science of trauma. And for the understanding of the quote unquote science, um, we're putting it in quotes to really um, underscore that there are many different ways of knowing. And many of our communities have uh, known the quote unquote truth, and I put it in quotes because it is their truth, but not a shared truth by many, um, about the impacts of trauma, about the historical impacts, about the community impacts, 
So much of the science that I'm going to tell you about today is actually not new. Um, again, many of our communities have known these truths and have known them in other ways of knowing. The NEAR science, N-E-A-R, is an acronym for neurobiology, epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, and resilience. So let's go ahead and go through each one. Again, this is introduction to trauma-informed care, so you're not gonna be experts in these sciences by any means, but instead we'll hopefully have the tools to inform a trauma lens, a lens through which you might be able to see certain behaviors and ways of being to understand them further to be maybe a result of trauma and toxic stress. Using that lens will then allow you to respond rather than react. We'll talk a little more about the trauma lens in a few minutes, but let's go ahead and talk about neurobiology to start with. So you see pictured here in the slide, the hand model of the brain. Um, the hand model of the brain has been shared widely by a psychologist named Daniel Siegel. I'm gonna brief, briefly review it with you right now, but I really do encourage you if you have any interest in this uh, way of understanding the science of trauma to take a look at some of the content that's available to you uh, on, the, on the web. Uh, particularly YouTube videos uh, can be pretty uh, available and accessible in that way. The way to talk about neurobiology, all in the interest of understanding how our brain development and functions are impacted by toxic stress, we could talk about the structures of the brain, which is what the hand model of the brain will do. We could also talk about the functions of the brain, functions such as memory, communication, sensory input, executive functioning. We'll do a little bit of both, really just to uh, paint a picture for you around what is happening to our brains neurobiologically when impacted by toxic stress. And why is it that that impact then could translate into certain ways of being, certain ways of reacting, certain ways of presenting, uh, and thus hopefully empower our trauma lens toward a bit more compassion and trauma-informed practice. So a significant part of the brain is built on experience. So trauma and toxic stress can impact the brain and its development and functioning. Oftentimes in trauma-informed care, we're encouraged to take a look at behavior as an adaptive skill. So if you're seeing a particular behavior, one way to use the trauma lens is to actually consider how is this behavior a potential adaptive skill instead of how is this behavior annoying or cumbersome to me, right? Which is an understandable response, especially when you yourself are under stress but it's a response that will limit our ability to provide trauma-informed practice or care in the moment. So let's talk about the hand model of the brain. And I'll go ahead and use my hand as an example, but you could also take a look at the um, slide uh, image in front of you. So the hand model of the brain is a really uh, n useful way to map out a couple of structures of the brain that can be um, on, that can inform our understanding of uh, the impact of toxic stress on the brain. So if you close your fingers over your thumb and touch those fingers onto the palm of your hand, this is what a calm brain, a brain that feels safe, may look like. And actually, um, the, if you map this brain onto the inside of your head, the tips of your fingers would be right above your eyebrow, and that is marking the prefrontal cortex. So when we're feeling safe and calm, the functions of the prefrontal cortex are available to us. Those functions are really anything that you consider uniquely you and uniquely your skills. So these are skills of planning and executing certain plans, these are skills around your communication. These are all the amazing trainings that you've had that you're able to then incorporate into how you say what you say, how you do what you do, um, all kinds of problem solving. All of those quote unquote higher functioning skills are available to you when your brain is fully online. 
when the brain experiences a threat to its safety, whether that's perceived or actual threat, the organism quite literally flips its lid, meaning that the lid of the prefrontal cortex goes offline and what's available to us is what's marked by the limbic system or the palm of our hand along with our thumb. And the functions of this part of our brain are really survival functions. So sometimes we hear about these as the fight, flight, freeze functions. Um, although research has certainly added many more Fs to this um, area, including fawn and extreme fright. These functions are survival functions. So when we are in survival mode, the quote unquote higher level functions come offline because frankly, when I'm in survival mode, my ability to uh, balance an equation or a checkbook for that matter may not be in my best interest, right? As a lion, tiger, or bear is chasing me, me sitting down and thinking about, oh, is this an endangered species? And I wonder what speed it's moving at. And huh, that color of that particular coat, that reminds me of this other coat. That is those abilities, though they're wonderful, may actually not be in our best interest at that moment. And so our organism is built such that those ways of thinking and those functions are offline. And instead, how we approach that dangerous situation, perceived or actual, is through the functions of fighting, freezing, fleeing. Okay. And as you're listening to this, think through how you notice this on a day-to-day -day basis with the people that you serve, with the people that you work with, right? Um, the other part of the brain that's marked by the hand model is actually marked by the um, wrist. And this is um, sort of the reptilian, the most primitive part of our brain. This is where functions of our body including our breathing and our sweating, rest, our heart, rate, our heart rate. So not very conscious to us, right? We haven't thought too hard about needing to pump our heart right now. Um, but they are incredibly communicative to the rest of our brain in terms of assessing whether or not stress and danger is around, right? So this is why a lot of the research around somatic healing practices is so critical because those actually work with these little primitive parts of our brain so that when we actually increase our heart rate and lower our um, uh, you know oxygen intake that means one thing to our brain versus if we um, are you know sweating and getting ready to run that means another thing so our um, spine and then um, the three different sections of our brain are marked by the hand model of the brain. So what you'll often see among people who appreciate the hand model of the brain is that with each other, they'll say things like, this is how I feel right now. <laughs> and so the person who is listening to you knows that, oh, the functions of the brain that are available to Anna at this moment are impacted by the fact that she's in survival mode. Yeah. What's really uh, fascinating to me, and Daniel Siegel talks a lot about this, is that there are certain fibers that connect the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And those fibers are really a form of resilience for us in that they really are, are uh, empowering our ability to not flip our lid. And those fibers are built by two things, reflection and relationship. And I just love that so much because I often wonder how in our uh, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and organizational environments, we support reflection and relationship. And the more we do that, the more really trauma-informed we could be because then we're actually resting in the realizing of pathways to recovery and resilience. So anyhow, a pretty, pretty fun little uh, extra note with regard to resilience and what builds it in terms of reflection and relationship. So we talked a little bit about the hand model of the brain, and I also mentioned to you the functions of the brain that are impacted at a time of stress. Uh, memory is impacted in that it is consolidated in different forms. 
So it's not that people who are under survival mode don't remember, it's that their re recollection of memories may come at certain, in certain ways, in certain forms, in certain order, if you will. Uh, communication is very difficult in survival mode. You might be able to relate to that the last time you were running late to, uh, to a meeting and feeling very um, overwhelmed because you just dropped your you know, favorite um, breakfast sandwich and your coffee and your you know, uh, child was sick the night before, right? If we're in survival mode at that very moment, our ability to even string a sentence together may be impacted. Um, our ability to take in sensory information is heightened in some cases. So when in the survival mode, lights are brighter, sounds are louder, touch may actually feel different. And executive functioning, functioning uh, such as planning and thinking through A, B, C, right? A sort of linear way of sequencing, knowing um, about consequences to certain behaviors, being able to kind of look ahead. All of those executive functionings, including problem solving, is actually impacted. What I want you to hear in this uh, section is that the functions of the brain are uh, profound and they are built for our survival and that our survival is based on both perceived and actual threat. And as we seek to be trauma informed, it is in our best interest as well as the best interest of our consumers and programs to actually take this information to, uh, to heart and really to incorporate it into our daily understanding in order to then empower the way we respond. And what I mean by that is if you are uh, in front of a consumer who you understand to be activated, they must have flipped their lid because of their presentation at the moment, then your understanding of what we now know about neurobiology would inform offering some water to this person rather than sitting them down and talking at them, right? Because talking at somebody, even with the intention of talking with, if they're in survival mode, will not be very effective. Not because they're defiant or uh, you know, disrespectful or difficult to quote unquote treat, but because their brains quite literally, just like yours and mine, when in survival mode, are not in a mode that optimizes communication, for example. Okay, so meeting basic needs at that moment, including water, for example, would be much more effective to bring the prefrontal cortex back online than doing some of the things we often do, um, which is to try to get at functions of the brain that unfortunately are impacted at this moment. So that's a little bit about the neurobiology of trauma. Again, there's a lot more we could say about this. In the interest of time, we'll move on to the next science of trauma, which is epigenetics. And we'll only spend a minute here to really underscore that epigenetics is helping us understand the impact of toxic stress and adversity and the way it's transmitted and experienced across generations. So there is a pretty vast science of epigenetics that has evolved over the last two decades uh, that really begins to map out ways in which um, historical and collective trauma for populations are experienced across generations. Um, and in some sense, this is nothing new, as I already mentioned to you. Um, many indigenous cultures and their teachings and their ways of life have already centered this understanding in their daily practice. So some of us would already acknowledge that our way of engaging in this world is really on behalf of seven generations before and after us. It's an expression of our ancestors and those who come after us. So that's just a moment about epigenetics. And you know, one way to, to speak about it is that you're not what you ate, you're what your grandmother ate. Uh, and so for some of you, there's a relief there. And for others of you, there's a, um, a little bit of a startle. And I only say that lightly to just in, encourage you to take a look at epigenetics if that's at all of interest to you. There's a lot of really interesting content out there that speaks about the historical and multi-generational impacts of certain world events uh, that have impacted groups of people, uh, including um, famine and war. 
Adverse childhood experiences is the A in near, N-E-A-R, we're in the A now. And adverse childhood experiences is, a, is an important study uh, that was conducted in the mid 90s uh, that essentially elevated trauma into the public health concern rather than just had it rest in the urgent care first responder world or the you know, mental health world of only those quote unquote survivors that um, healers have been engaging with. Instead, what the Adverse Childhood Experiences study did, which was a, a collaboration with Kaiser and the Center for Disease Control, is that it mapped out this profound um, understanding, which again, many of our communities have known, between the relationship of adversity in childhood and challenges in health and other forms of being and well being in adulthood. And so 10 adverse childhood experiences were mapped. Uh, those included emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, violence and alcoholism and drug abuse, and incar incarceration of a parent or caregiver, um, and uh, mental illness of, of a family member. And, um, and so those 10 do not include the many, many other adversities that many of our children experience today, but they are a sort of marker of the 10 and the impact of those 10 on the uh, well being of adults in uh, later life. That well being includes uh, physical wellness as well as behavioral and mental health. And what the study showed uh, over 17,000 participants of Kaiser members is that there was quite a uh, relationship between uh, people's experiences of adversity in childhood and their adversity um, and toxic level of stress in adulthood, including heart disease, diabetes, stroke, COPD, uh, now, I want to alert you to the pyramid that you're seeing. Uh, this pyramid was revamped by RISE, R-Y-S-C, which is a Oakland-based uh, youth-serving organization. It was revamped in that it added a couple of more layers to the original pyramid of the ACEs. And it added them to really underscore the importance of uh, race and social conditions and local context. Uh, what we mean by that is that adversity in childhood doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? That something like neglect, for example, uh, would be insufficient to talk about without talking about uh, employment and food deserts and uh, prenatal care, right? So they actually added the green layer of social conditions and local context to the original pyramid that you may have seen in some of your other trainings and study. And uh, furthermore, they added the purple layer, which again, in the context of what we're talking about today, will hopefully make sense as to why, which uh, was named generational embodiment and historical trauma, right? That actually to talk about adversity in childhood uh, does not happen in a vacuum, similarly to the local context, but actually may uh, be happening at the heels of historical and generational trauma. So the things to point out here is that the ACE study shifted the conversation about cause and context rather than symptoms and effect. The new knowledge uh, was brought to the forefront in a lot of places, including our medical system, but that really it also validated practice-based wisdom. That um, I th the other thing I would underscore here is that, you know, this is a pyramid, not a square, as we like to say at Trauma-Informed Oregon. Um, and the reason why we point that out is that adversity in childhood doesn't immediately have a direct causal relationship to early death, as is marked in this pyramid, right? That would be a square. Instead, the pyramid underscores that there is all the void space around, which are the protective factors which in some cases it are the very roles that you play in people's lives, right? It's the role of healers and caregivers and caretakers and teachers and coaches and family members and culture and um, other forms of empowerment and healing. 
So in a lot of ways, the adverse childhood experiences study is um, putting into context uh, practice-based evidence that we've known for generations um, and is redefining some of the ways in which we see people's um, behavior later in adulthood um, as connected to early childhood experience. Again, lots more research that you could um, hear about, uh, including um, research coming out of um, different, uh, different parts of Oregon, as well as around the country, uh, centered around adverse childhood experiences and its connection to adulthood well-being. The last, R, the last uh, science, if you will, is the resilience. So that's the R. And really knowledge about resilience lets us know what buffering variables can reverse, prevent, and heal adversity. And buffering variables are really uh, variables that are looking to essentially create a um, safe context for adversity that may happen in life naturally. Um, and so there are certain uh, ways of creating both an intrapersonal interpersonal, as well as organizational uh, way of um, culture, if you will, that supports and uplifts these buffering variables. And so this is just one way to understand those buffering variables. The variables centered around service, connectedness to others, self-efficacy and mastery, and self-reflection. And one thing I would invite you to do even at this moment is just consider how often do we provide these opportunities for the people that we serve? How often do we provide these opportunities for ourselves to have a sense of service, not just given the work that we do, but broadly, to actually have connection to others? And what does that look like even in our time today? What does self-efficacy and mastery look like? And finally, what does self-reflection look like? And again, you can map out the reflection and relationship and the powers of reflection and relationship into this area of understanding resilience. So the resilience here, and I, I, it feels important to note, is not just within the individual, that this isn't just about how resilient are you and what kind of practices and or I don't know, expensive shiny things do you need to surround yourself with in order to have resilience. Um, that actually is less of the factor that we're considering in trauma-informed care. And instead, what we're looking at is how can our organizations, practices, and procedures, and even spaces foster resilience? What do we mean by resilience? Well, how can they foster community and culture as prevention, as buffer? How can we foster service, connectedness to others, self-efficacy, mastery, and self-reflection? So we'll um, invite you to consider those. Um, as, we, as we wrap up the, the near science of trauma, what I'd like to do is actually um, hear from you about ways that in which um, some of these sciences might be informing uh, your understanding of some of the people that you serve. So um, wrapping up the near science of trauma uh, and ways in which uh, toxic stress and trauma might be manifesting in your um, daily life, particularly with the people that you serve, I'm interested to see what behaviors have you noticed in your work? What behaviors or manifestations have you noticed in your work? So it could be the feelings of uh, being unsafe, engaging in harmful behaviors. You're welcome to choose more than one in this poll that I just launched. Tending toward anger or aggression, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, and thus uh, the behavior of isolation. Um, feeling of hyperarousal and a sort of um, hypervigilance, having trouble managing emotions and quote unquote regulating, feeling overwhelmed, sometimes confused and depressed, certainly not being able to imagine a future or disengaging and isolating. What are some of the behaviors you're noticing in your daily experience with consumers? You go ahead, pick several if that feels meaningful to you, and we'll give it another minute. We have about 50% 
participation currently. It's lovely. All right, we'll give it another 30 seconds. There's over 70% participation. Again, we're looking at what behaviors you're noticing in your work. Behaviors such as feeling unsafe, engaging in harmful behaviors, feeling hyper aroused with memory and communication problems, having trouble managing emotions, not being able to envision or imagine a future disengaging and isolating. Wonderful, thank you so much for your participation. It's wonderful to see you all engaging in this. So here are the results of the experience that you all are coming across in form of behaviors that you're noticing in your work. Feeling overwhelmed, confused, and depressed seems to be the most common, uh, but Many of them are pretty high scoring, including having trouble managing emotions, feeling hopeless and helpless and therefore isolating and so on. What we'd like to suggest here is that the behaviors you're naming may be a result of toxic stress and trauma. Using the trauma lens is a way to look at a person or in some cases, a community or an event, and reframe the behavior through the lens of what we know about trauma. The brief overview you've just had about the science of trauma gives you a sort of background to empower your lens to understand and see through that lens the behavior and presentation that many of you have just named. What I want you to hear is that trauma is not always the answer. You may be using many other lenses in your uh, daily uh, work. You may use the lens of uh, what I know about uh, dementia, what I know about brain injury, what I know about uh, cultural um, manifestations of behavior, such as, for example, eye contact, right? So let me use that as an example. If a consumer is having a difficult time maintaining eye contact with you as you're engaging with them around a particular service, you may put the trauma lens on and conclude that this person is experiencing some level of stress around you. And you may want to check in about how they're doing, how they're feeling. Maybe they're even in the midst of a flashback, right? You could though also put a different lens on for example, your cultural humility lens. And in that sense, take into account that for, for particular cultural ways of understanding, eye contact may be experienced as actually rude, uh, as actually a way of um, projecting a kind of um, offensiveness and, and aggression. And so it's almost, it's in some cases, a sign of respect to not maintain eye contact. You could put on your drug and alcohol treatment lens. And through that lens, you may conclude that, oh, this person might actually be under the influence. I should maybe give a you know, um, drug test here. So it's a little bit of uh, a um, small example, given the realm of experience you all are dealing with on a daily basis. But I really do want to underscore here that just because we're talking about trauma-informed care here, None of us are looking to really um, convince you of or push the agenda of that trauma and toxic stress is always the answer, because it's not. Uh, but in order to be trauma informed, we're looking to actually strengthen your ability to enrich your care and your response to individuals by considering how the experience of trauma, adversity, and toxic stress may be impacting this individual's perception this individual's needs, and thus this individual's behaviors. So using the trauma lens essentially informs your ability to be responsive rather than reactive. 
and thereby empowers your ability to be a healing presence in someone's life. Remember that notion of resisting re-traumatization? We are using the trauma lens to realize the widespread impact of trauma and pathways to recovery, to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma and adversity in both our consumers as well as ourselves. So using the signs of trauma to then respond through our physical spaces, our practices and procedures by resisting re-traumatization. That was the definition of trauma-informed care. And the near science of trauma empowers your ability to use the trauma lens to actually um, see people's behaviors through that lens. It does not justify or excuse the behavior in any way. If anything, it holds everybody much more accountable to uh, the presentations that you see, but it actually puts it on a map that is much more than empowering to you in terms of level of response. So for the next few minutes before we take our break, we're gonna do an activity and you're gonna be using the chat box to uh, give us some of your input here. So the vignette, if you will, or the case scenario is that you're with a consumer and they're showing aggressive behaviors. They're yelling and they're displaying anger. Maybe it's through their body language. Maybe they are threatening with something in their hand. Maybe they're giving you um, a kind of scowl look, right? So the consumer is showing aggressive behavior. In the chat box, just for a moment, I'd love to hear what a non-trauma-informed system or non-trauma-informed lens would say about this person. So go ahead and type into the chat box what would a non-trauma-informed system say about this consumer who's showing aggressive behavior and yelling and displaying anger? Wonderful. I'm so appreciative of people chiming in here. Things like they're crazy, they're dangerous and unsafe. They're doing it for attention, attention-seeking. They must have a UTI. Yeah, this notion of quote-unquote crazy, they're violent they're having a behavioral issue, what's wrong with them? Um, they must be on drugs. Oh, let's medicate them, we need to manage this behavior. Mm -hmm. Attention seeking, the client is out of control. Yeah, thank you so much, I really, possible UTI, excellent. That, that one came up a couple of times. Uh, will not be able to, it's just a, not redirectable, behaviorally inappropriate, mm -hmm. to be managed, dangerous. Wonderful, I'm so appreciative of how easily you all can access the non-trauma informed uh, way. <laughs> now, again, I, I, it's important to, to stay lighthearted about this while also underscoring the incredible precious opportunity we have here, which is to use the trauma lens to understand this behavior in another way. Again, we're not looking to justify it or excuse it we are looking to understand it so that actually we could respond rather than react. Reactions often hurt people. Reactions can often be re-traumatizing. Responses that are based on the trauma lens way of seeing behaviors are actually there to respond in a way that is um, prioritizing relationship, prioritizing healing, prioritizing uh, creating safety for all involved. And so in that, I'm interested in uh, answer to number two. Thank you again for all this incredible participation. What do we know about trauma and toxic stress that may actually shed light on this person's behavior? So go ahead and shift to now answering number two in the chat box. What do you know, especially now as a result of this training about trauma and toxic stress? that may actually shed some light on this behavior of aggression, of yelling, of displaying anger. Yeah, so that what we know about trauma and toxic stress is that something in the environment may be triggering to them or activating. We also know that what could be re-traumatizing is this person in front of them. What has changed in their home care environment recently? Uh, the question of what has happened to this person rather than what's wrong with this person. The lens of maybe some need is not being met. What could it be? 
Yes, what we know about trauma and toxic stress is the people who are experiencing it may be overstimulated. Their senses may actually be heightened at the moment. Wonderful. That this person is um, telling us that there is a need that's not being met. So I'm not able to read all the chats out loud for you, but I'm, I'm really appreciating the, the themes here and the level of understanding. And again, this is not a way to, um, you know, leave room for uh, unsafe behavior, um, be especially when there is aggression involved. Safety of all people involved is absolutely paramount. Um, and a way to respond in a tra non-trauma informed way to a person who may be behaving due to a particular experience of toxic stress and trauma is to actually heighten their sense of lack of safety. Yeah. Wonderful. I so appreciate um, your responses. So let's do the last one since you all are such experts already. I'm interested what strategies might you consider in responding to this behavior now that you're wearing the trauma lens. What strategies? And I know you all have encountered these, this kind of presentation before. And in a lot of ways, many of you have been doing trauma-informed care. You just never called it that. Because that is oftentimes um, best practice, is that people who've been in the field so long are actually doing trauma-informed care. That's kind of evidence-based practice or practice-based evidence, if you will. What are some strategies that you might consider in responding to this person. Offering them a cool drink or a hot drink, suggesting some deep breaths, speaking in a soft and soothing voice. Yeah, so those are especially those things like using soft and soothing voice and looking at our own body language, our own physical positioning are all ways to see how we ourselves might be the threatening stimulus. So how do we make ourselves a little less threatening? Yeah, excellent. Um, getting to eye level is another way of saying that. Yeah, wonderful. Providing some personal attention and care. Yeah, this notion of, oh, this is attention-seeking behavior, a uh, trauma-informed response may be, so thus I will give it the attention that it's asking. <laughs> um, and again, we do not want to um, do away with procedures that uh, facilitate safety for people. Uh, but we are looking to kind of flip the script on what our purpose and role is here and to really broaden our lens on how we can create interactions that are restoring connection. One thing that we often talk about in these trauma lens activities is that at this level, when we're talking about strategies to respond, we have three opportunities. One is to be traumatizing. Another is to be re-traumatizing. And the third is to be a healing presence. So think about the ways in which we could respond that is traumatizing, that is re-traumatizing, or that could be a healing presence, that could be a buffer to the stress that this person must be experiencing in the moment. Thank you so much for all the um, wonderful suggestions you've all had. Um, yeah, so, you know, what we know about trauma is that oftentimes regulating emotions may be compromised once, or, once the survivor has been activated. So if this consumer has experienced trauma and something has activated them in the environment, maybe it's you, maybe it's a smell that they just smelled, maybe it's a song that they just heard, maybe it's a particular date, right? It is... Um, I don't even know what date it is. It's May uh, 6th. So it may be that May 6th holds some truth for them and their bodies. So they're activated. What we know about trauma is when a survivor is activated, emotion and emotional regulation may be compromised. What we also know is that being activated can affect a person's cognitive ability to take in information, which can lead to experiences of feeling helpless unsafe and out of control, right? Here you are talking at them about this week's list of activities, but they themselves are feeling activated. It is incredibly frustrating and 
disorienting and could feel lead to feelings of helplessness and lack of safety. And then the aggression comes out. And it's not a linear, fully conscious, like, therefore I will aggress. It's just the series of events that unfolds often when an activation happens in an environment that's not able to hold that kind of activation in a non-trauma informed environment. Sometimes engaging in aggressive behaviors may have actually been effective, have been effective in a way to protect themselves from painful experiences in the past. So it may be that showing aggressive behaviors and yelling is actually makes perfect sense. It's just that it's now being used in an environment that um, may not be most, uh, it may not be most suitable and most effective. And so we want to honor that some of these responses, some of these behaviors are actually brilliant coping mechanisms that um, have been uh, incredibly useful and powerful for survivors. So what we want to do right now is uh, take a little break. It is 2.30. We're going to come on back at 2.40. If you have any particular needs or questions, go ahead and chat them to the panelists. Um, and we have Oregon Care Partners here to support us. Um, and I will then start the next session with some uh, questions. So go ahead and take this time to actually take a break. This is a great time to grab some water, to shift your body as feels good and safe to you, and to really ultimately look away from the screen. When we come back at 2.40, we're gonna start up with just a couple of questions that you may have about the content that we just covered, and then we'll go into application. Thanks, y'all.
All right, welcome back everybody. It's 2.40. I hope you're feeling rejuvenated and able to take a nice deep breath to recenter for another hour and 15 minutes or so. I'm so appreciating reading through these chats and there's so much wisdom in the room. So I encourage you uh, to scroll through them. Um, lots of fantastic uh, suggestions for ways of understanding uh, the difficult behavior, in this case, aggression, and then ways of responding. Um, clearly, there's a lot of wisdom. And again, it's not uncommon for individuals and communities to uh, realize at a, a training like this that uh, they've actually been doing trauma-informed care all along, that that's what's kept them in the work for so long, that that's what uh, has actually empowered uh, their way of understanding uh, resilience and healing. Um, and then to also realize that, oh, right, there are some other things that I could do something about, uh, both on an intrapersonal level, the interpersonal level, and then the programmatic level um, within your own circle of influence, uh, within the confines of many other factors that seem to be pushing against the current um, of trauma-informed care. So we'll talk a little bit about those in a few minutes as we turn to application of trauma-informed care. But before we do, I wanted to uh, open it up for a few moments for any immediate questions that you might have. I'm also happy to move on and then leave plenty of room at the end for questions. Uh, but I did want to pause for a moment and see. You can put the question in the chat box if you'd like. And uh, we will uh, have Tiffany um, share it with us. Um, so let me pause for a second and just see, are there any immediate questions that relate to what is trauma-informed care? What is trauma? Why is it important? And the use of trauma lens. Okay, I'll give it one more minute to see if anything arises for anybody. And again, if not, that's okay. I see your full participation and engagement, so it's no problem at all. I just want to leave enough space for a question. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and move on. We're going to talk for the next hour about uh, the beginnings of application of trauma-informed care. And again, there's lots more that could be said about this and hopefully some peer support from colleagues and others that could be received about this. I mean, it's really a whole trajectory of a way of life, really. It's not a checkbox or a, a list of things to do and then be done. Um, so we'll talk about that for about an hour and as uh, questions arise, feel free to put them in the chat box and Tiffany will, uh, you know, track them and then present them to me at the end. So to help us uh, orient to the application of trauma-informed care, what I'd like to first do is uh, share with you the six principles of trauma-informed care. Uh, these principles are shared with us by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, it's a federal oversight agency that has informed quite a bit of uh, our uh, study and development of trauma-informed care, along with partnerships from communities and uh, voices of lived experience. Uh, and so there might be other ways to understand the principles of trauma-informed care, but really the, uh, these are the six that have been most widely used. And so I'll unpack them individually uh, for a moment and then also give you a little bit of a, a shorter version of them. So if six is too much to remember, 
especially when your brain is like this, which mine is often, um, not because of necessarily an immediate uh, danger, but because some levels of stress tend to bring me into uh, a mode of functioning that's a bit limited. So sometimes six is too much to remember. I will share three with you uh, at, the, at the conclusion of this. So let's unpack these uh, for a moment. What do we mean by physical and emotional safety? Again, you're looking at this through the lens of not just what happens between two individuals, but how the organization itself, how the program itself could hold, could host a space to support these principles. So safety is unpacked for emotional and physical. And what is uh, spoken about in that sense is that throughout the organization, staff and the people they serve, so consumers in this case, feel physically and psychologically safe. The physical setting is safe. The interpersonal interactions promote a sense of safety. And the understanding of safety is defined by uh, those who are served as the highest priority. So things like lighting, what the bathrooms are like, what the exits and entrances look like, um, and so on. And we'll speak a little bit more about safety. Trustworthiness and transparency is one of my favorites. Uh, and I say that because many of the policies and procedures that I sometimes have to enact as a result of my particular uh, license or the particular program I'm working in are things I can't actually change at this very moment. And so if I am in that situation and I feel like maybe what I'm about to do is actually not very trauma informed, the use of transparency is my greatest tool. So for example, if I am uh, working at a front, as a front office administrator uh, and I'm about to hand a 30 page intake form to uh, a family who's about to fill out those 30 pages, right? And I know that that is just so burdensome and cumbersome and not actually trauma informed because I'm not actually going through it with them and I actually don't even have a pen to lend them and some of the copies are really, um, you know, old and oh, it's actually not in their primary language, right? Like all those things that we're all holding that are so complicated and in some case we don't have a circle of influence around, the least I could do as I'm handing that 30 page intake form to this family is to be transparent about what is happening, right? That doesn't mean that I'm throwing anybody under the bus and it doesn't mean that I am speaking poorly about the system that I'm part of. It just means acknowledging that this is burdensome. Here is our water cooler and uh, may I bring you some water as you're filling this out. Is there any other support person who could um, sit with you as you complete this paperwork? Um, when you complete it, I could actually highlight some of the areas that you've missed and you might want to revisit. Um, so some level of transparency is such a useful tool uh, when uh, engaging in a trauma-informed way. So organizational operations and decisions are conducted in a transparent way with the goal of building and maintaining trust. Uh, trust is such an important uh, aspect of relationship building. And in many cases, it's to be earned. Um, many people, uh, for a number of reasons, have had a lack of trust in um, the service that system that we're part of, uh, have had a lack of trust in terms of any kind of quote unquote helping profession, have had interpersonal breaches in trust. And so the principle of trust building is a really uh, important one and one to also respect as we don't get to call when trust is happening. It's actually in the um, eyes of the beholder of the service user or consumer themselves. Peer support and mutual self-help. Uh, peer support uh, is key to establishing safety and hope, building trust, enhancing collaboration, utilizing stories of lived experience to promote recovery and healing. And so many of our uh, research practices right now are pointing to how important peer support and mutual self-help is in all kinds of healing and recovery practices, how incredibly empowering it is to hear from those who've come before us, 
who don't necessarily wear the particular white robe or have the name or title after their name or have the diplomas or the other um, sort of tokens of how, um, what kind of healers they are around them, but instead it's the people who have quote unquote survived. It's the people who have gone before us, who provide us with a sense of I'm not alone. Um, and that kind of peer support and mutual self-help is actually critical to trauma-informed care. Collaboration and mutuality is, uh, again, another um, real gem in these six of trauma-informed care. And what I like to point out is that really, uh, no matter what our role is in the system of care that we're providing, there's always an opportunity to be collaborative and to show a sense of neutrality. Um, and again, there are ways in which many of our um, policies might restrict and put some boundaries around certain things that serve a purpose oftentimes in order to maintain safety. Uh, and those are important. Uh, what's also important is to use the uh, principle of collaboration neutrality to really always ask ourselves, how can we level the power difference? At this very moment, how can I look through the lens of power as the difference it between consumer and service provider and see how I can level that at this very moment? Is it my body language and the stance that I'm taking? Is it the ways in which I show up as a human and I share with you that, you know, my kid didn't sleep very well last night, so we're feeling a little bit off today. That's not sharing too much and or putting the burden onto somebody else. Of course, please don't do that. It's more about I get to share a piece of my humanity with you that actually could relate with you in a way that diminishes my power so that I'm not having a power over but it's a power with, right? Maybe it's just, oh, wow, as I walked into our residence, I noticed those roses and they smell so good. Did you get to smell them today, right? It's that, oh, you have senses and I do too. And that's the way we can actually have neutrality around our lived experience. Empowerment, voice and choice uh, is, some, is another uh, principle of trauma-informed care that is a great lens through which to take a look at our policies, our procedures, our practices? Um, are we uh, building a culture where uh, the consumers served are actually acknowledged, uh, that their expertise, that their strengths, that their um, preferences and their experiences are being acknowledged and built upon? Consumers, are they being supported in a shared decision-making, even around the smallest of things? Um, certainly bigger of things. And when we do provide an opportunity for choice and voice, are those points of feedback actually being incorporated, right? Uh, similarly, are staff incorporated into um, the uh, co-facilitation of certain uh, trainings and uh, uh, incorporating staff feedback into revamping of certain policies and procedures so again, as I mentioned at the beginning, trauma-informed care is not just about the consumer. It's actually about the service users as well, the quote unquote staff. So looking at these six principles through that lens too. The last but not least is the first one on this uh, graphic, which uh, in, in my opinion, SAMHSA kind of does a little bit of a catch-all uh, to name cultural, historical, and gender factors. Uh, into, into consideration. And in my opinion, it's actually one of the most important ones uh, because our way of engaging in dominant culture is actually often um, not centering cultural, historical, and gender considerations. And so here we're being invited to actually actively move past cultural stereotypes and biases based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, religion, gender identity, and actually offer access to gender responsive services to leverage healing uh, value of traditional cultural connections incorporated into policies and protocols. Um, being responsive to racial, ethnic, and cultural needs of individuals and their families. Recognizing and addressing historical trauma so those are just some examples. And again, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll unpack these uh, further in talking about how we apply them. 
I promised you that I'll talk about six, but then I'll also give you a little bit of a um, helping hand by summarizing them into three. So if six is too much to remember, then I invite you to remember three, safety, power, and value. So if you have somewhere to take notes, um, and if you want to put this on a sticky note on your dashboard as you're on your way to work or in your uh, wallet as you're entering the bus or in your um, you know, staff room, safety, power, and value. And all the principles can fall into those three. And these have been marked by trauma-informed Oregon as three that are inclusive of all six of these. And the question then is, how am I intrapersonally, interpersonally, and operationally uplifting and supporting safety, power, and value of the individuals involved? The reason why those three are named as such is that at a point of impact of trauma and toxic stress, those three are three that are actually denied and taken away from an individual. As you recall, some of those examples of toxic stress and trauma that your consumers may have experienced, something like war, let's say, you, you can see how safety, their power, and their sense of value has been denied. And so to be trauma-informed is to actually uplift safety, power, and value in all that we do so that every interaction with a survivor can be that of a healing presence, can be that that supports a sense of safety and emotional regulation. So let's talk about the intrapersonal, interpersonal, and operational ways of applying this. Intrapersonally, it's really about checking our own beliefs about trauma-informed care. You know, I like to say that um, trauma-informed care is not looking to be political or partisan in any way, that really, especially as somebody who works in um, the state of Oregon that is so diverse in so many ways, including its political views, that my mission is not to have trauma-informed care be exclusive in any way. But I do want to uh, say that to be trauma-informed is to have a position. Um, a trauma-informed stance is not a neutral one. And I say that because of these beliefs that we really need to check and see where we are on them. So for example, the notion that trauma is prevalent the trauma actually happens, it happens often, it's often underreported, and it happens amongst us all. And that's not to say that we're all in the same boat or the same experience, because what's also happening is that trauma is perpetuated by certain inequities in our systems, and that the experience and the effect of that trauma is perpetuated by those inequities. Another belief, for example, is that trauma, including childhood trauma, can influence behavior in adulthood. If we have any uh, uncertainties or uh, insecurities in that belief, then it would be helpful to actually unpack that because it would be difficult to then move forward and uh, promote trauma-informed practices when we ourselves are not uh, believing that people's experience of trauma that has occurred in childhood may, and in fact often is, influencing their presence in adulthood. That it's not a sort of thing that, oh, it happened in 54, they should be over it by now. It actually doesn't work that way, and our sciences have certainly shown us that. And the last belief that service settings can be re-traumatizing is a belief that um, trauma-informed care is sort of based built on, that we need to, again, just check in with ourselves. Um, we're not here to convince anybody of anything. It's more of an inquiry around, how, it, does this belief resonate with you? And would that be an intrapersonal way to explore trauma-informed care in your experience? Uh, that traumatic stress um, and uh, the ability to navigate certain systems, the ability to receive adequate care that is culturally responsive, um, gender affirming, um, that is inclusive and accessible is uh, to be trauma informed. And that many of our services historically, and in some cases currently have not provided that. And that that is activating a toxic response in many people. And so one way to talk about 
the intrapersonal level, the like personal, internal, intrapersonal level of application of TIC is to go ahead and explore what are some ways that you yourself are able to regulate. What are some ways that you yourself actually on a ba daily basis are doing your best to not flip your lid? Because again, what we know when our lids are flipped, when we're in survival mode, is that we are looking to survive. Our best practices when it comes to our care of others don't come from a place of survival. They come from a place of creative problem solving, considering the other person's uh, and community's perspective and so on. And so here I'm gonna invite you to uh, engage in a poll, uh, but before I do that, I wanna explain the stress curve to you. Uh, there, you know, you're seeing it move from too little stress, and I can't even remember a time when I've been in that situation, but let's just remember a time when we were in the green, when things were just flowing in a way that it was just too little stress. <laughs> and then it moves to yellow, orange, and to the red. The red is the survival mode, the burnout, the breakdown, uh, may even look like a full-blown anxiety or panic attack. So when we're in the red, what we know is that we stop differentiating be between perceived and actual threat, right? In this mode, we are just in survival mode. Our brains have stopped differentiating between perceived and actual threat. What we also know when we're in the red is that stress hormones like cortisol are pumping throughout our body and our brain and thus lowering our cognitive functioning. They're lowering our capacity to problem solve. They're lowering our capacity to be creative. And in our body, the consequence of all of that cortisol and other stress hormones is that it's increasing our heart rate, our muscles are getting more tense, we may have trouble sleeping, we may experience indigestion, tightness in the jaw, and so on, okay? What we also know about the red is that over time, the cortisol thermostat, if you will, resets and essentially diminishes our fuse and get, of getting triggered by just about anything. So we become so hypervigilant. If we are in this mode often in our workplace, in our families, in our communities, then our ability to um, sort of refine what we get activated by is actually diminished. And so in that sense, we get triggered by or activated by um, many more things and thus become more hypervigilant. And the last thing I wanted to share about being in the red um, just to really underscore that we're not our best when it comes to the care that we provide is that we tune out uh, verbal uh, content that really we're just so prone to misinterpreting others that we're super hypersensitive to nonverbal cues uh, and just see if that's true for yourself with your colleagues and the people that you serve. And so on an intrapersonal level, what I'm curious to learn from you is what strategies do you use on a daily basis to move from the red to the orange, or maybe even the orange to the yellow? I'm not inviting the possibility that every time you go to work and or every time you're in the presence of another, you be in the green. I'm not inviting the possibility that to be trauma informed is to have it all together. Um, that's, not, that's not real, that's not true, and ultimately when it comes to actual peer connection, um, that's, that's not actually uh, possible. We, we, we invite you to be human. Uh, but we, what we do need on an intrapersonal level when it comes to trauma-informed care is an ability to have tools in place, policies and procedures in place that support our ability to regulate, that support our ability to move from the red to the orange. So when it comes to workforce wellness and trauma-informed care, it is essential to talk about trauma-informed care and not talk about the wellness of the staff uh, is to really be incomplete in our understanding of trauma-informed care. Um, Bessel van der Kolk says that, you know, hurt people hurt people. And I would add that that's true when hurt people are not aware of the fact that they're hurting. 
Um, so again, it's not that you need to be uh, in the green and have lived a life of no harm in order to be a caring presence to another. It's that you yourself as an individual and the organization through the lens of workforce wellness is able to cultivate a sense of wellness for you and help you move from red to orange or orange to yellow. So I'm going to share a poll with you and see um, if you could tell me a little bit about what strategies do you use to bring yourself from red to orange? You can choose multiple strategies, such as drinking water, taking some deep breaths, taking some space from the situation, listening to music, talking to a friend, moving your body in some ways. Um, we don't want to center ableism here, so dancing and walking may be one of those, but stretching or just simply shifting weight may be another way. We've already had 50% of you um, vote here, so we'll give it another 30 seconds. Feel free to choose more than one, and I imagine many others are not on this list. So go ahead and start putting them into the chat box. What other strategies that are not on this list have you been using to move from the space of red, from the space of utmost survival into orange? Thank you so much for the uh, suggestions to, that are coming into the chat box. I'll go ahead and end the poll because over 80% of you have contributed and I'm so appreciative of that. Um, some are coming through the chat, including praying, <laughs> shopping, journaling, reading, uh, taking a nap. Yeah, if that's an option, that kind of reset seems to be working quite a bit for people. Uh, writing, um, taking trips places, uh, being outside, um, access to nature. Yeah, and you can see in the results that I'm sharing um, how, how much is uh, available for people. And what I'm going to invite you to do now as you're looking at these answers is consider how your program, especially if you're in a program versus um, just you yourself or a caregiver, uh, but if there is an actual culture of a program or even an institution in that sense, how can we in order to bring a trauma-informed culture into that workplace, actually support some of these strategies. So for example, taking, taking some space from the situation is impossible if you are understaffed, if you don't trust your colleagues and your coworkers, if you um, are feeling like uh, you'll be written up because of it if breaks and the ability to take space is not a culture that's being supported, if there is no space to actually take um, because every nook and cranny of the facility has been um, operationalized somehow, right? So this is just a way to consider then how we might actually operationalize some of these best practices that you all have been using onto an organizational level. So what can we do to support taking some deep breaths. Can we actually maybe provide a training on that? Can we actually support that as a, as a form of uh, community care? And the reason why we say this is that it's important in trauma-informed care not to just place the burden onto the individual to quote unquote self-care. The burden is not solely on you to go ahead and drink your water and take your deep breaths. To be trauma-informed is actually to share that burden with the organization, with the procedures and policies, with the culture that you are working in, so that both can uh, actually hold a space of care. Yes, at the end of the day, you are the only one that can take that deep breath for you. I can't do it for you as your colleague, but as your colleague in a culture of trauma-informed care, I might be able to have a sign across the room that actually gives you the hint of maybe we should tap out. I will go ahead and take over here, right? Or maybe we have a particular way of connecting every 45 minutes, no matter what, we're gonna pass each other and uh, check in about how we're doing. Um, or maybe it's uh, integrated into our um, you know, note-taking or our end of shift handover, right? Is that we start the whole thing by taking a deep breath together. Um, and again, you get to be creative about what this looks like for you. Trauma-informed care is going to underscore why these practices work. It's not that they work because they're, you know, lovely and comfortable. 
they work because of what we know about the science of trauma and toxic stress. The drinking water, taking some deep breaths, listening to music, taking some space from the situation are all excellent ways to actually move the brain from a toxic level of response into a more comprehensive, a more full brain of response. Let me stop sharing this one and move into the next level, uh, which is interpersonal. There's so much more to say about wellness and workforce wellness and caring about the caregivers, if you will. Um, again, in the interest of time, we'll stop there when it comes to the intrapersonal level. Uh, but I so appreciate hearing some of these suggestions as well. Um, so interpersonally, meaning what do we do with each other, uh, listening through to this content through the lens of not only what we do with us consumers, but also what we do with each other in terms of colleagues, okay, uh, in terms of community members. Our work on an interpersonal level is to prevent re-traumatization. So what we mean by that is doing everything we can, and there it won't be comprehensive because there's so many um, uh, different ways of activating folks, but knowing what we know, what can we do to actually prevent activation of triggers? What can we do to prevent re-traumatization? If I know that walking into a um, space to fill out an intake form is likely going to be activating for people, especially if they're walking into the same building that used to be the building that uh, administered food stamps back in 1965, right, then I, I am already taking that into account in the way that I set up my space. I'm already taking into that, that into account in what kind of documents I already have translated because I know my community and I know the languages in the community that are spoken. And so I'm going to proactively do what I can to prevent re-traumatization. Then, Interpersonally, our job is also to recognize early warning signs. So to use that trauma lens to recognize some of the early, so when people are in the yellow and the orange, we don't have to wait until we see our colleagues and our consumers in the red. If we tune into the trauma-informed lens, we can actually begin to recognize some early warning signs. And this is where person-centered care again comes in because knowing the full person, knowing some of their day-to-day um, -day ritual and routine is a way to then be able to notice some early warning signs. And then when things do escalate, when there is an activation, intervene with the absolute goal of de-escalating. Intervening with any other goal, like let me teach you a lesson, let me punish you, let me put you on a behavioral plan, all of that is really moving the goal and the purpose of intervention away from the essence of what's needed. What's needed at that level is de-escalation. What we mean by that is moving the brain from survival mode into you're safe. You do have power and you do have value, right? Safety, power, value. So another way to understand this is when we look at our behavior, and our way of engaging with each other is through the lens of, again, this flipped lid. So the ground that we stand on interpersonally is that we understand and accept that there are alternative explanations to behaviors, okay? Again, this is an intrapersonal inquiry. In order to sort of embody trauma-informed care interpersonally, this is one of those beliefs that is core. And again, it is that we understand and we accept that there are alternative explanations to behaviors. What I mean by that is all of those non-trauma informed explanations you all were chatting into the chat box for the aggressive behavior, right? That it's not just that people are manipulative, aggressive, rude, not compliant, difficult, difficult to manage, um, have a UTI, right? Like all of those things. It's actually also that maybe there's an alternative explanation to this behavior. So once we go from there, meaning use the trauma lens, what do we do when we are engaging with somebody whose lid is flipped, meaning they're in survival mode? We prioritize de-escalation. We prioritize regulation. That's a way of building trust and creating safety, right? And when the lid is not flipped, 
which actually is pretty common when the lid is not flipped, what do we do? We're actually then in, uh, prioritizing empowerment and collaboration. We're actually looking to promote a sense of self-worth. It's not uncommon for me to provide these trainings to uh, groups who notice that, oh right, there's actually trauma-informed work to be done when there isn't a crisis. And that trauma-informed work is actually then buffering resilience. It's actually building relational foundation to act as a preventative, to act as then an intervention, or to maybe even act as a postvention. But when the lids are not flipped, there's still trauma-informed care to be done. There's still ways to build relationship and connection and support collaboration and empowerment that is in the name of trauma-informed care. Let me move to operational and give you some more examples. And what we mean by operational is really just moving things from a practice-based level to more of like a procedure or maybe even a policy. What we mean by it is moving it from how you and I are interacting to how we are interacting as a culture of an organization or a program. So the circle of quote unquote operational could really be pretty small or pretty large, right? So the operation of, you know, Kaiser as a whole unit or a particular facility within Kaiser, right? So operational is how we elevate from interpersonal to a kind of systemic way through practices, procedures, and policies. So as I mentioned to you, safety, power, and value are one way to uh, summarize those, three those six principles. I'm gonna use that to actually give you some examples. So what do we mean by safety on an operational or organizational level? Here again, we're inviting you to consider not just the consumer, but the staff as well. And you'll see that in the examples, we're actually shifting in both giving examples in the interest of the consumer as well as in the interest of the staff. So for physical safety, for example, some things to consider is what does the physical space look like? Um, now, as you move into the physical space with the trauma lens, can you maybe notice the artwork? Is it inclusive and inviting of cultural, historical, and gender contexts? Um, can you notice what the signage looks like? Does it perpetuate a sense of you don't belong here and here are the rules that you have to follow? Or is it a welcoming way of um, supporting physical safety? Um, are there doors that immediately have, you know, signs and locks and do not enter, do not touch, this is not yours? And what kind of message are we sending uh, when it comes to safety, both physical and emotional? Um, who is allowed to come in and out of the facility? And how do we attend to unease? Um, is there, you know, one common way to sort of attend to physical safety is to ask about it. You know, is there anything I can do right now to help you feel more safe? And this notion of safety and collaborating with others in promoting safety um, is, is an important one. It's, it's about um, we can do what we can with using the trauma lens to promote safety. We can do what we can to listen to how that those efforts are actually being experienced by people who are uh, who have the experience uh, uh, of you know, uh, taking part in our program, and then make changes. Uh, so the, the experience of physical safety is really paramount to a survivor's ability to fully show up. And so some examples include lighting and bathrooms, and I already mentioned signage and exits. It also, for staff, means training and being able to have space for quote-unquote self-care, uh, being able to speak about vicarious trauma and actually have vicarious trauma prevention plans. Um, these are all areas around workforce wellness, which is a whole nother realm of training, but it is important to point out here because it really is an important factor in trauma-informed care. So how do we actually uh, promote uh, these quote-unquote safety plans, not just for the people that we serve, but for each other as service providers? It's uh, also interesting uh, in long-term care to consider uh, how we might fall into a tendency to center physical safety over all else. Um, 
And, and again, there is no like right or wrong way. This is just another inquiry of how is it that some of our policies and procedures might be centering physical safety over all else for sake of some kind of maybe liability. Um, and that the balance is about protecting while protecting safety while maximizing independence. Uh, so if somebody is a fall risk, for example, how do we maximize independence in a person-centered way while also prioritizing physical safety? And what does that look like? What does it require of staff? Emotional safety considerations. Again, this is all within the context of safety. So do we have clear and consistent boundaries? Or do those boundaries shift as the shift changes, right, in terms of who shows up um, next? Are we able to um, actually state and model what those boundaries look like and follow through on them? Uh, transparency and trustworthiness is where uh, this, uh, where the principles uh, fall in, right? Are we able to explain why? when we do have a particular requirement of a consumer, or if we are in a position to have to do something as a staff, do we have an explanation as to why? And if we don't, that's one really fantastic way to break trust. There is no reason why we can't share with our consumers and with each other on an organizational level, the why in a procedure. Um, if it's because we don't know, then maybe we need to get that information or at the very least be transparent about that we don't know. But just notice how a lack of transparency is actually perpetuating a sense of harm and power, power differential that has historically been harmful. Predictability, what's going to happen next and actually sticking to what we said was going to happen next. Right. So even in a webinar like this, outlining what we're going to cover and actually sticking with that. And if I, for example, can't because I'm running out of time, then being transparent about that. Um, so anyway, examples on the right hand side um, are being brought to you, many of them by the um, incredible collaboration we've had um, to create this content. But consistency in scheduling and communication. Um, offering activities that promote safe movement and engagement of the senses, um, access to a quiet outdoor space, uh, activities that emphasize choice, right? So that even when we are providing activities, can we at the very least offer some choice around what those activities are? And can those choices be relative to the consumers that are being provided the choice? Right, so that if the choice is around a particular activity, but that both of those choices have nothing to do with my interests, my um, strengths, then it doesn't really feel like a choice. Um, peer support and staff mentoring. Um, and can there be mentoring of new consumers? Is there a way to actually promote a sense of mastery and agency within the consumers by pairing some level of mentorship? Um, Residents and family volunteers and opportunities to share life stories uh, in the name of, you know, not wanting to re-traumatize each other. There's also this incredible perpetuation of silence that's happening that's actually pretty harmful. And so how do, can we create a safe context for stories, stories of joy, stories of difficulties to actually continue to live on and to be shared with each other? Do we recognize the impact of historical trauma and the current issues of uh, our people, including uh, Native and Indigenous people in, in Oregon? And how are we actually uh, making room and accounting for those and creating emotional safety? Let's move to power and value, and then we'll wrap up and see what kind of questions you have. So please feel free to um, start thinking about any questions that you want to share with everybody. So in power, we're looking to actually find opportunities for consumers, family members, and staff to always be in quote unquote learning mode, right? To have, to be empowered, to actually be experts, to be empowered, to actually be able to do things with and for themselves. Um, and so the, the notion of empowerment, um, you know, you may need to do for somebody first, but can we keep in mind the possibility that sharing the power in the smallest of ways um, is really the key to restoring power. Um, offering choice whenever possible 
and in some sense, you know, quote unquote, keeping it real, being honest about where the choice is not, you know, I'm sorry, I can't provide you the choice around whether or not you take this medicine, but I can provide you the choice of water or juice if that's clinically appropriate, of course, right? So seeing where, you know, I can provide you the choice uh, by sitting up or taking it while, um, you know, standing up. What I, again, within the context of your own work, you know what those choices are, but don't underestimate the power of choice, especially at a place and a time in people's lives where so many choices have been limited. Um, peer support, again, we've talked about and how incredibly useful it is both for staff as well as consumers to be in contact with, quote unquote, those who have come before, those who are currently in the space in a way that actually moves the expertise to the people with the lived experience rather than the people with the credentials or the titles or whatever else. Um, you know, food is a great way to honor the individual or honor the community or the family. Um, so what would it be like if we actually, you know, had an opportunity to ask, what do you like to eat? And, you know, can you, or can you help prepare um, this particular food um, as that is appropriate? So there's some examples on the uh, right hand side, um, clear and appropriate messaging about rights and responsibilities is is really uh, central. And the reason why this is especially important in trauma informed care has to do with consent. Um, the, I understand that in many of our uh, services, you know, it's oftentimes just another form that I need you to sign in order for us to move forward. Maybe it's a pamphlet that I've copied 30,000 times and now is a little bit crooked. Um, that's like the consumer rights and responsibilities. This is how you file a grievance, but really I don't want you to file, you know. I understand the, the culture that um, we've, we've been in in many of our systems when it comes to uh, putting the notion of rights and responsibilities and consent forms is just like another thing that needs to happen so that I'm not liable. Um, but I wonder if we can actually kind of flip the script and center how incredibly useful and actually healing it is for an individual to see rights and responsibilities and consent forms as actually central and essential to their stay and their um, uh, healing and recovery with you. Uh, can we actually honor it and elevate it in order to restore power? So we did safety, both emotional and physical. We did power, and now we're doing value. And again, we're looking at it on an operational level. How can we elevate and support procedures and protocols that are supporting these kinds of practices? And again, maybe you're noticing that you already are doing them. You just never call the trauma-informed, and that's wonderful. So valuing the individual that could happen in so many ways, you know, remembering their name and pronouncing it accurately, asking for their nickname and using it when appropriate, right? Um, honoring life experience and strength and values um, of many people who are uh, our consumers now were something else years ago. Do we know that? Can we celebrate that? Can we elevate it and honor it, right? Can we value a life lived? Can we offer collaboration, uh, both in terms of how we're collaborative with consumers and their families, but also how we're collaborative with each other? Are there multi, um, uh, a multi um, uh, expertise uh, meetings, right? Uh, are we informed by many different ways of knowing? Uh, is, you know, the nursing, as well as the medical, as well as the social work, as well as the spiritual, as well as the case management and the occupational and the dot, 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 are they all able to have a voice um, at, the, you know, at the table in the treatment plan? Is the family involved? Is the consumer involved as much as is possible? Um, and relationship and a sense of neutrality and a sense of authenticity seems to be the way that trauma-informed care can sustain itself on an operational level. And what I mean by that is that especially survivors um, can smell inauthenticity from miles away, right? If you really don't care and you're in a position of transacting rather than relating, if, if there is an agenda there, people can actually sense that, right? Uh, either consciously or their bodies just know it. 
And so if that is the way in which we're interacting with each other and that's the culture we're building in our organization, then at the very least, we need to be transparent about it. Um, if we want to change it and impact it, then can we hear from the voice of the people of what would work differently, right? So acknowledging voices and actually incorporating them into the decision making. Um, the preview do review is a really great way to value the individual. Here is what I'm about to do. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what we did, right? And then what about involving the voice of the person? What would you like to do? Here's what we're doing. What did we just do, right? It's just such a wonderful way to value um, the lived experience of the person. Interdisciplinary teams was the word I was looking for. Um, doing warm handoffs uh, so that any kind of change in staffing um, doesn't feel so compartmentalized and artificial, um, but seeing how we can quote unquote do warm handoffs. And when we do them, what are we translating? What matters? Is it just what time the person had their you know, bowel movements and what time their meds were administered last? Or can part of our handoff also include something? What is one thing that brought them joy today? What is the one thing that they recalled that you might want to continue the conversation with them in the next shift, right? So can we actually take a look at our handoff protocols and see how we're evaluating the individual during that time? Um, so let's just finish up uh, for a few moments with just defining what we mean by the culture of trauma-informed care and really underscoring that what it involves is really all aspects of the program that to be trauma-informed is not just on the social worker. It's not just the responsibility of the home manager. It is certainly not just the responsibility of the caregiver, that actually all fronts, all aspects of the uh, system or the institution, however small or large it is, have a value to play and a role to play in the uh, trauma-informed care. That um, it actually involves making changes into a new routine that and what we mean by that is that to be trauma informed you might look at the trauma lens use the principles of trauma informed care to make certain changes they could be very small it doesn't have to be a whole you know transformation of the institution which in fact may be a little bit jarring for everybody and in some cases re-traumatizing it's just slight changes that could be made and then listening listening to the voice of the people both of the consumers and the service providers to see how it went how is it going? Oh, great. Let's keep doing it. Let's put that into context somehow and actually keep a history of why it's working. Oh, it's not going great. What should we change now? And actually change it up again. So the trauma informed care is really a process. It's not a check mark kind of list, and it's certainly not a one and done process. And that it really involves committing to that process and the ongoing quote unquote assessment. And assessment doesn't have to be a punitive, you know, you made it or you didn't. It's really about assessing how we're promoting safety, power, and value, both of the consumer and of the service provider. So, what I wanted to do is uh, uh, invite you to engage in one last poll. And this poll is asking you to. Uh, consider if you feel ready to start something specific to uplift safety, power, and value for consumers as a result of this training. Do you, or is there something that you want to stop doing um, to support safety, power, and value? And the last option is to actually continue, to continue doing what you've been doing through the lens of supporting safety, power, value. We're not gonna have the time to actually ask you to share with us those commitments, although that would be such a wonderful way to use uh, the chat. And we'll see uh, if there are any questions. If, if there aren't, we would love to hear from you about what will you try out? Um, and again, it could be in the smallest of ways. What is one thing that you're willing to start doing, even tomorrow, even tonight, to promote safety, power, and value? Um, what is one thing that you want to stop doing? Because now that you are, have heard about the trauma lens, you're actually realizing that uh, it may be, even though it was not your intention, it may be impacting a lack of support of safety, power, and value. And lastly, what's one thing that you would continue doing? Because, wow, now that you hear about trauma-informed care and now that you're understanding some of the toxic stress impacts on our brains and bodies, 
I should just keep doing this. I didn't realize it was trauma informed, but yeah, absolutely. So I'll give it another 30 seconds to get, we have over 70% response rate. I just want to make sure we're hearing from everybody. And then we'll um, open it up to some questions and to also hear from you um, about some of your commitments, some of your aspirations. Given another 10 seconds, we have 80% response rate, which is wonderful. You all are almost done. You're participating very, very well. <laughs> All right, so let me stop it and share with you. Um, yeah, it's so, so enriching to hear that um, your analysis of the moment is that it's not about stopping certain things, but it's actually about starting some new things and maybe continuing others. Uh, and again, it's um, not uncommon as a result of these trainings to actually realize, oh, uh, what I've been doing could be called trauma-informed. I just never called it that. Um, and actually just celebrating those things and seeing how we can then move them from the interpersonal level to more operational. So that which has worked for you for all these years, can we make it best practice in our organization? Can we actually learn from each other in that way and actually operationalize some of these things rather than leave the burden on just us as individuals to keep it all together, right? Let me stop sharing this poll and pause for a moment. Um, we have a couple of other logistical things to um, do, including show you a brief video um, of what trauma-informed care is to others in the community so that you can see that you're not alone in this. But I want to pause for a few minutes and uh, open it up to questions. Um, we could do it in the chat box. Tiffany could help us with that. Um, what are some questions that you have for yourself? Yeah, how are people helping staff and consumers feel safe during this pandemic? So I'd love to hear, thank you for that, Tina. Um, I'd love to hear from uh, participants uh, about this. So uh, please, in the chat box, uh, there are over 85 of you in the room. So there is lots of wisdom, practice-based wisdom. How are staff and consumers um, feeling safe during this pandemic? What are people actually doing to help both staff and consumers feel safe during this pandemic? Go ahead and put it in the chat box so that we could learn from each other. I have some thoughts as well. Um, Trauma-informed Oregon uh, provides a lot of trainings and consulting and so I've heard from many um, dear ones in the field uh, across the state who are doing some tremendous work during this time. Just taking the time to talk, uh, daily video check-ins with the staff, uh, making sure that we center how people are feeling, putting videos up for families on the business page so that folks can see them, phone check-ins, running a Zoom room for caregivers, sending cards, yeah. Yeah, you know, in answering this question, one thing we could do is actually just run through the principles and see how we could use the principles to empower some of our answers, right? And again, there's so many other answers coming through the chat. It's so wonderful. So I'll let you read those. Um, some things that are, that are really working for people is that what we know about some of our stress response during this time is that the notion of time uh, becomes very complicated. Uh, I don't know about you, but, and I actually demonstrated it to you earlier, um, I didn't even know what date it was, right? And uh, I'm, <laughs> here I am delivering some important content, right? So the notion of time uh, becomes extra difficult uh, at a time of crisis response. And so one thing that's pretty simple to do, uh, both for staff and consumers, is implement certain practices to underscore time. And what I mean by that is actually beginning our staff meeting with today is Wednesday, May 6th, right? Even something like as slight as that, uh, when seeing a consumer and good morning, 
Juan, today is Wednesday, May 6th, right? Um, or orienting to where we are in the season, right? Um, the notion of time is a really helpful tool in moving us from a toxic level of stress to a tolerable one. Part of the reason why this time of this incident response has been so toxic for a lot of people is that the notion of how long it'll go on for is infinite. We actually don't know. We don't know when the toxicity of the impact of this is going to move from infinite to, okay, I got it now, right? We don't know when the quarantine will be over for certain communities. We, there's so much about it that we don't know. And to move from a toxic level of stress to a tolerable, one differentiating factor between toxic and tolerable is the notion of time. Toxic stress feels like it'll never end. And oftentimes it never ends, right? The toxic stress of poverty, the toxic stress of abuse and violence, the toxic stress of racism, right? The tolerable stress is to actually move the time marker into having a beginning, middle, and end, right? So a dentist appointment is tolerable for many of us because we know it'll be over, right? Um, sitting in on a really difficult uh, conversation or training, we know that it'll be over at some point. And so it moves it into tolerable. And so that time is actually such a useful way to actually give a quote unquote lifeline for people to move something that is experienced as toxic, because again, we don't know when it will be over, to actually tolerable if we just focus on the now, if we just focus on what we can do today. The ability to see things through many lenses so that when in survival mode, our sense of, um, of seeing outside stimuli as threatening, as uh, contributing to our lack of safety, is what our brain will automatically do. But if we can provide procedures and um, practices to actually encourage the brain to see strength, to see blessing, to see gratitude, it will actually allow the brain to come back down a little bit. And that's not to put a silver lining or a kind of rainbows and unicorns reality on an otherwise pretty difficult reality for many people. Um, it's not to deny the toxic level and the cost of the toxic level of this reality, but it's also to invite the possibility that there are actually other things also happening, right? That, um, you know, somebody had, you know, and it could be the, the a big one or a small level of gratitude or um, positive um, seeing, right? That uh, we had all staff show up to work today and that that's actually really um, something to celebrate, right? That everybody is physically well today. Can we just offer some gratitude about the fact that at this moment, everybody is healthy, right? Um, so using time, using the notion of gratitude and or um, positive ways of experiencing reality without, again, doing away with acknowledging the cost. Finding some ways to offer peer support. So some people have already mentioned about creating more space for people to share their experience. Um, on the one hand, we're all in this. On the other hand, we're not all in this together in the sense that my experience is dramatically different from yours and that's okay. And actually acknowledging that level of diversity is key to actually honoring my experience and yours. So can we create space and opportunity for people with shared experiences to get together? Right? What does it mean for a staff member who's also a parent, who's also, um, uh, you know, uh, has uh, an elder in their immediate family who also, um, you know, what does it mean for them to experience this and how can they connect with others with similar experiences? Um, because I think one way to uh, not see and honor that level of diversity is to actually deny people's individual um, experiences of this. So offering some support in creating context for people to connect with each other in a unique way that they're experiencing this. So that I, as a parent at this moment, who's also working, who's also um, a daughter of an elder, have a certain unique experience that I can then relate to in a way that maybe I can't with others. Um, and that level of peer support has been really helpful.
Um, we've also find, found that rituals and routines are really helpful without pushing the let's get back to, get back to normal. So what we want to do is honor that we've had a staff meeting every Monday. We're going to go ahead and keep a staff meeting every Monday, but maybe we'll change the way that we conduct that meeting. Maybe we'll start the meeting with a um, check in about how people are doing or what kind of needs or mutual support that they could use mutual aid. Um, but we will go ahead and maintain the routine of having a staff meeting every Monday, even though um, it's difficult keeping the routine may be the thing that's helpful. So, so too with our consumers, how can we see if we can maintain routines and rituals um, without again pushing this notion that, oh, actually everything is okay, so we're just going to go ahead and stick with the normal uh, because everything is not okay and, it's, um, and it would be denying uh, the truth of people's lived experience if we just ignored it. So those are some suggestions. Uh, but again, so many people have awesome ones that I'm seeing in the chat box. Was there another question? Um, Tiffany, I don't know if you saw one coming through or if anybody else had one. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, just show a brief video. Uh, this is in an effort to really communicate uh, to you that you're not alone in this and all your efforts and attempts to um, inform your best practices and your daily experience through the lens of trauma-informed care. Uh, there are so many other people also doing it. Uh, so we wanted to share this video with you um, and uh, before we wrap up, before we take it, uh, Healing. Resilience. Connection. Transformative. Dignity. It means generational healing. Hope. Compassion. Access. Inclusion. Inclusion. Acknowledgement. Safety. Resilience. Relationships. Curiosity. Knowledge. Trauma-informed care is true equity. To be contagious in a positive, informative way creates a stronger generation of people to come after us. We come from all different walks of life and experiences, and it's important to acknowledge that. That we now know that racism is a form of trauma. Long-standing stigma that people do not recover. If you don't understand where somebody's coming from, then then it's hard to help them. Because it empowers people. It saves maternal and child welfare and lives. Because I love people and I think this is how we all get free. We as a community are finally being seen, we're being talked about, and we're being included. The people of color in my community, um, it's important for us to be informed of our own trauma and for others to be informed so they know how to work with us. Because it holds systems and organizations accountable for how we do the work. The biggest impact has been something small, which has been Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, which within our team we use to help us all be able to say when life is overwhelming and we need a break. It has changed the discourse from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. The building on our strengths and acknowledging the resiliency that we have had from one generation to the next. I think we have all embarked on a collective hero's journey, and now some of us are aware of it. The combination of violence awareness, resources and materials that are accessible, with the acknowledgement of the effects of historic trauma in the disability community. Witnessing people open their minds and shift to a non-judgmental attitude or presence even that wasn't fully nurtured before and now is. 
trauma-informed care aims to break down barriers that impede the growth of foster youth. The staff has a chance to puzzle through real-world experiences in a way to decide how they're going to handle situations before they arise. It creates more empathy based on lived experience. It has just made us better people. Offering aid that levels the point in a way that levels the playing field in this game that we call it. Empathy. Patience. Policy. Support. Self-awareness. Sustainability of the workforce. Training. Compassion. Accountability. Collaboration. Trust. Systematic change. I know that's not one word, but it does need to be changed on all levels and all systems. Listening. Attunement. Understanding. Education. Education. Dedication. Community. Value. Have value in the community. What's that one word again? Persistence. Power. All right. So I apologize. It sounds like it was quite loud to start with, and that was not trauma informed of me. Could have given you a heads up that that was going to happen. So I do want to apologize and acknowledge the harm done there. Um, we, uh, if you had a difficult time hearing that uh, video or audio or hearing or seeing the video, um, it's available on the Trauma Informed Oregon website, uh, which again is where I'm housed and I'll show you the contact info for me um, toward the end. Here's some community resources. Uh, again, in the name of peer support as well as safety, um, we want to make sure that you are aware of some of these resources. And again, there are probably many others that um, you can uh, access. Uh, and just as the video was attempting to demonstrate, uh, these are people across systems across the state of Oregon who are uh, committed to trauma-informed care just as you are. And so if you're looking to connect with others and get some more training and some more support, uh, feel free to be in touch. Uh, both Oregon Care Partners and Trauma Informed Oregon is here to support you. Um, what I want to do is give you a uh, heads up about the post test. So in order to get your continuing education units, um, you will need to stay online as we um, end this webinar so that you can then take the test, which will give you the um, continuing education units. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my email into the chat box and it's um, A-H-R-I-S-T-I-C at pdx.edu. Um, and then I'll put the Trauma Informed Oregon website just as a, again, sister organization of Oregon Care Partners for any additional support that you could use. But again, please uh, feel free to be in touch with either of us in order to, um, yeah, get further support. So thank you all. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and I, I wish you and everybody you come into contact with to remain healthy and strong during this time. Thanks, everybody.